Hello, today we're going to be talking about disorders of the eyes, ears, and other sensory organs. Sensory receptors, sense organs, are classified in two categories, general senses and special senses. Special senses will include the ear and the eyes. These receptors are classified by their location. Extraoral receptors are located close to the body surface, and they're often called cutaneous receptors. Examples would include receptors for touch, pressure, temperature, and pain. Your visceroreceptors or your interoreceptors are located in the body, and they provide information about the environment around the viscera. Proprioreceptors provide information about body movement, orientation, and muscle stretch. These proprioreceptors are often referred to as muscle sense because this is the part of the muscle that helps promote or control kinesthesia or movement. Sensory receptors are also classified by their stimuli. Mechano Mechanoreceptors are stimulated by some mechanical force like touch, pressure, equilibrium, or hearing, whereas chemoreceptors are activated by a change in the concentration of the chemical, taste, or smell. And then thermoreceptors are stimulated by a change in temperature. These are your warm and cold receptors. Photoreceptors respond to light stimuli. No receptors respond to any tissue damage, and the sensation produced would be pain. Osmoreceptors are specialized receptors that are concentrated in the hypothalamus, and they help us recognize changes in our osmotic pressure within those body fluids. Visual information is received from light rays that pass through the transparent cornea and then the lens. They focus the image on the receptor cells of the retina, the rods, and the cones. The visual stimuli are then conducted by the optic nerves to the occipital lobe of the brain to help interpret, interpret and process the information received before being sent to other appropriate areas of the brain. There are three types of cones named according to their color, blue, red, and green. Cone cells are more prevalent in the macula, the part of the retina that's responsible for our central vision. Cone photoreceptors are sensitive to light at various wavelengths. For example, the red cone would activate in red light or when looking at red colored objects. The same applies to blue and green cones. However, if an object has a color other than the primary red, green, and blue cone colors, then the different cones would activate to produce the object's color. For example, the red, green, and blue cones would activate and mix to produce white whenever we look at a white vehicle. Yellow, however, is created by a mix of green and red cones. The bony orbit of the skull helps protect the eye. Eyelids and eyelashes will deflect foreign material away from the eyes and protect the eye from excessive sunlight and drying. The levator palpebrae superior, which is the muscle of the upper eyelid, is controlled by the oculomotor nerve, cranial nerve 3. Eyelids are lined with thin mucous membrane known as conjunctiva that continues over the sclera of the eye. Continual secretion of tears helps wash away microbes, particles, or other irritating substances. These secretions contain lysosome and antibacterial enzyme. Remember, these are part of the nonspecific defense. Tears form in the lacrimal duct on the superior lateral area of the orbit and flow across the eye and drain into the lacrimal canals in the medial corner of the eye and into the nasal cavity through the nasal lacrimal duct. Tears help keep the external tissue of the eye moist and healthy. So just remember those um, tears, that's part of the 
first line of non-specific defense. Extrinsic muscles help control movement of the eyeball. There are six skeletal muscles. There are four straight rectus, rectus muscles and two angled oblique muscles that are coordinated to help move and rotate the eye and are under the control of cranial nerves three, four, and six. The eyeball itself is comprised of a spherical three-layered wall filled with fluid. The main parts of the human eye are the cornea, the iris, the pupil, the aqueous humor, the lens, the vitreose humor, the retina, and the optic nerve. The iris helps control the size of the pupil. The opening allows light to enter the lens. Light will enter the lens, pass through the cornea, and the aqueous humor. Then the lens focuses the light, which travels through the vitreous humor to reach the retina. Finally, within that retina, specialized cells called rods and cones then convert that light into electrical signals and are transmitted through the optic nerve to our brain. The anterior portion of the three layers differs from the posterior portion to allow passage of light rays. The outer layer is a tough fibrous coat, the posterior portion of which is the sclera, the anterior portion of which is the cornea. The sclera is the visible white part of the eye and the cornea is transparent and it's a bulging portion through which the light rays pass and are refracted. If you look at another person's eye from the side, you can observe the curve of that cornea. The cornea does not have blood vessels in it. It is nourished by the fluids around it, by oxygen diffusing from the atmosphere. The source of oxygen is a concern for people that wear contact lenses, especially those that wear them for long periods of time. Of course, that's going to block the absorption, or at least partially block it. The middle layer of the eye, or the uvea, is made of the choroid. This is a dark, vascular layer just adjacent to the sclera in the posterior portion of the eye. The dark color helps absorb light. It prevents reflection of light within the orbit. Numerous blood vessels within the choroid supply nutrients to the outer layer of the retina. In the anterior part of the eye, the choroid helps develop the ciliary body and the iris. The ciliary body is consisted of the ciliary muscle, which will control the shape of the lens to focus the image of near and distant objects accurately and clearly on the retina and the ciliary processes that secrete aqueous humor, the fluid that is in the anterior cavity of the eye. The iris surrounds the pupil, and this is where light rays pass into the interior of the eye. The iris is pigmented. It gives eye its distinctive brown or blue tone. The iris has two muscles that control the size of the pupil. The circular or the sphincter muscle contracts in response to parasympathetic stimuli or excess of light on the retina, and this causes the eye to become the pupil of the eye to become constricted. Under sympathetic control, or control of the sympathetic nervous system, the radial muscles of the iris, when contracted, would cause the pupil to dilate open. This function is easier to remember if we associate it with the stress or the fight or flight response in which sympathetic stimulation causes the pupils to dilate and improves our vision, especially in dim light. The lens of the eye is a transparent lentil-shaped structure inside your eye. It's made of an elastic capsule that surrounds an alignment of fibers. Nutrients are provided from the aqueous humor. Together with the cornea, the lens provides refractive power for the light that enters the eye. The lens is held in place by ligaments. The suspensory ligament connects the lens to the ciliary body. The shape of the lens is altered as contraction of the ciliary muscle alters tension on the suspensory ligament. 
The lens changes its thickness and curvature and allows the eye to focus on objects from varying distances. This adjustment in lens curvature or accommodation helps bend the light rays or refract them to enter the eye just enough to focus a sharp image on the retina. If your lens has an irregular curvature, you're more prone to develop astigmatism. Cataracts are another lens-related visual disorder in which the lens become opiac or cloudy or hazy, impairing our vision. <clears throat> the inner layer of the eye is the retina. This multi-layered coat is present only in the posterior or the back two-thirds of the eye because the light rays passing through the lens cannot bend enough to reach the retina. The retina is, cons is comprised of a pigmented layer of several layers of neurons. In the center of the posterior retina is the macula lutea, a yellowish area that contains a depression called fovea centralis. This is the area that has several cones that provide the most acute vision. Visual acuity or sharpness of vision is greatest at the fovea centralis. The innermost layers of the retina consist of the rods and the cones that are light sensitive photoreceptor nerve cells. Rods are specialized for dim light like in night vision and cones are going to be color sensitive. Light energy is absorbed by the ro rods and the cones and converted into electrical energy into the neurons. And then those three types of cones that we talked about previously, red, green, and blue, then determine your color perception based on how they mix. Color blindness is common in males and it results from a deficit of one type of cone caused by an abnormal gene on the X chromosome, the sex-linked recessive gene. Again, there are three types of cones named according to their color, blue, red, and green. The cones are going to be more prevalent in the macula because that is the part of the retina that is responsible for your central vision. The posterior cavity is the space between the lens and the retina and it contains that transparent jelly-like vitreous humor. It also holds the retina against the choroid to make sure that the retina gets all the nutrients that it needs to help maintain the shape and the size of the eyeball. Floaters can sometimes pass through a person's visual field. These are small specks or shadows that move about and eventually settle to the inferior part of the eye. The anterior cavity between the cornea and the lens is divided into the anterior chamber, which extends from the cornea to the iris, and the posterior chamber between the iris and the lens. The chambers are connected through the pupil. The anterior cavity is filled with aqueous humor, which is continuously secreted by the ciliary processes in the posterior chamber. The canal of Schlem encircles the eye at the junction of the cornea and the iris, and it returns the fluid to the blood. To maintain normal intraocular pressure inside the eye, the normal range being from 12 to 20 mmHg, with an average of 15 mmHg, the amount of aqueous humor formed must equal the amount reabsorbed. Intraocular pressure should be maintained below 24 mmHg. So we'll see a problem with this in people that have glaucoma. Normal pressure maintains the shape of the eye. The aqueous humor supplies nutrients to the lens and the cornea because they lack the blood vessels to bring supply in on their own. Light rays from an object are able to pass through the cornea and then they're refracted then through the aqueous humor and the pupil. The curvature of the lens will adjust to refract the light rays so that they converge on the retina to provide a sharp image of the object. The light continues through the transparent aqueous humor to the retina. 
In there, the photoreceptor neurons, the rods, and the cones are stimulated. Light energy is then converted into electrical stimulus. That electrical stimulus is transmitted by the optic nerve to the occipital lobe of the brain where the image is identified and integrated with other information. The double image projected from different angles by the two eyes gives a wider visual field and the central overlap of the visual fields helps provide depth perception. Nerve impulses from the ganglion cells of the retina will converge in the fibers of the optic nerve, cranial nerve 2, and then leave the eye at the optic disc in the posterior portion of the eye. The central retinal artery and the vein help supply the retina. These vessels and other structures pass through the optic disc. The optic disc has no rods or cones, and this forms what we call the blind spot. Because the optic nerve is essentially a projection of brain tissue surrounded by cerebral spinal fluid and meninges, assessment of the eye can often provide useful information about other problems in the body, such as hypertension or vascular changes as a result of diabetes. Remember, diabetes will affect those small vessels and that's exactly what's in that eye. The optic nerves can carry visual stimuli to the occipital lobe of the brain. The optic nerves from each eye will unite to form the optic chiasm. At the optic chiasm, half of the fibers from each optic nerve cross to pass the occipital lobe in the opposite hemisphere where the left occipital lobe receives information or images from the right visual field. Damage to the left occipital lobe would result in loss of the right visual field. Perception occurs in visual sensory and association areas of the occipital lobes of the cortex. Remember, if the primary cortex is damaged, you'll be blind. If the association area is damaged, then the information, the um, eye may be blurry or may have difficulty seeing. So other things may be affected there. The parts of your eyes like to work together like a relay team to help pass that light that enters your eye along the pathway to your brain. So the light passes through the cornea, which is the clear part at the front of your eye. The cornea then focuses the light through your lens into a signal that will hit your retina, the layer at the very back of your eyeball. eyeball. The retina would convert that light into an electrical signal that your optic nerve would then send to your brain and your brain would use those signals to create the image that you see. The Snellen chart or similar eye charts consisting of lines of progressively smaller letters and numbers help measure visual acuity. A visual field test may be used to check central or peripheral vision, and tonometry helps look at intraocular pressure by checking the resistance of the cornea. An ophthalmoscope will be used to examine interior structures of the eye, and gonioscopy measures the angle of the anterior chamber. Muscle function and coordination can also be tested. Each row of the Snellen chart represents a level of visual acuity based on two numbers. The first number describes the Snellen chart's distance away from the patient. This number will almost always be 20 to represent that the client is 20 feet away from the chart. The second number tells how clearly a person is able to read a line from the Snellen chart when they are 20 feet away. For example, if someone has 20-20 vision or normal vision, it means that they could clearly read the line from 20 feet away that any other average person could also read from that distance. If someone has 20-50 vision, it means that they have to be 20 feet away to read a line from the chart that someone else with normal vision could read from 50 feet away. The Snellen chart makes it easy to prescribe 
corrective lenses, and restore sharp vision. Myopia is nearsightedness. This means you can see objects that are near clearly, but you have difficulty seeing objects that are farther away. For example, if you're nearsighted, you may not be able to make out highway signs until they're just a few feet away, or you may need to sit at the front of the classroom in order to see the chalkboard, or the whiteboards in our case. Hyperopia, or farsightedness, is when you see things far away better than things that are close up. So your eyes will focus distant, will focus better on something that's distant than on something that's close up. You would have a general eye discomfort like a headache whenever you do close up tasks like reading, writing, computer work, or drawing for a long period of time. Presbyopia is the gradual loss of your eyes. Usually we see this with the elderly. So the ability, or as we're growing older, the ability to focus on nearby objects. It's a natural, annoying part of aging, and it causes farsightedness associated with aging. You may be aware of presbyopia when you start holding books and newspapers at an arm's length length in order to be able to read them with the natural eye. So a lot of times we'll invest in reading glasses at this point so that we'll be able to at least read. And it really only affects that, you know, close up object that you're trying to read like the newspaper or a book. Myopia happens when the image is focused in front of the lens and it may be because the eyeball is too long. If your eyeball is too long, the light that enters the eye won't be able to focus correctly. The image will focus in front of the retina, the light sensitive part of your eye, instead of directly on the retina, and that causes blurred vision. If you're farsighted, the light ray doesn't focus the way it should. Your eye is too short or the power to focus is too weak, so the image goes to the wrong place behind the retina, and this also makes things look blurry. With normal vision, an image is sharply focused on the retina. If you have presbyopia, your inflexible lens won't adjust to focus the light appropriately, so the point of focus falls behind the retina in the bottom image, and this makes close-up objects look blurry. So remember, this is a type of uh, farsightedness that occurs with aging. Astigmatism is from an irregular curvature, curvature in the cornea or the lens. Str Strabismus, squint, or cross-eyed can result in double vision, also known as diplopia. Strabismus can be caused by weak or hypertonic muscles, a short muscle, or a neurological deficit. It is actually a misalignment of the eye in which one eye is turned in a direction different from the other eye or deviated. Again, there are six extrinsic muscles that work together to control the eye movement and point the eyes in the same direction. If you have strabismus, these muscles have problems controlling the eye movement and they're not able to maintain a normal eye position. Strabismus in kids needs to be treated immediately because it can prevent the development of amblyopia. Amblyopia will develop when the strabismus and the brain has continually suppressed the image from the deviated eye. As a result of that suppression, the eye doesn't receive the stimulation it needs to develop normally. Amblyopia is often called lazy eye and we would patch the strong eye in this case to strengthen the weakened muscles in the lazy eye. We might also use atropine drops in the good eye, which would make that eye blurry and make the lazy eye work better.
Nystagmus is involuntary movement of one or both eyes. It can be this back and forth rhythmic jerky motion, circular motion. This abnormality may be seen in neurological cases. Uh, it can occur from inner ear or cerebellar disturbances or from drug toxicity. Sometimes we'll also see this in psychiatric or seizure patients. Uh, diplopia or double vision or paralysis of the upper eyelid known as ptosis may be caused by trauma to the cranial nerves resulting in paralysis of the extraocular nerves. This can happen in stroke patients, and sometimes patients will lose their depth perception. So in other words, when they go to step down on a step, they don't know how far down it is, and this can be a cause of falls in some patients when they lose that depth perception because they have no idea where their body is really in relation to stepping down. When both eyes are focusing on the same object, object each eye sees the object from a slightly different angle. The brain will compare and process the eye information from each eye to form a unified image. Depth perception is the ability to see things in three dimensions, including length, height, width, and distance. Depth perception is our brain's ability to discern the different distances between objects as closer or further. Depth perception also helps us judge distances when we drive, play sports, and even read um, can be easier to read when we have the appropriate depth perception. Depth perception requires the eye's ability to aim and coordinate together. Symptoms of depth perception problems would include things like clumsiness or bumping into things, poor spatial awareness, avoiding certain activities or sports, having difficulty catching a ball or judging the out of bounds lines, bumping into teammates while playing sports, difficulty with driving, uh, reduced reading performance, poor handwriting. So if you look at the picture down here, these images illustrate how the same scene might look to the left eye versus the right eye. If you look at the objects, um, you'll notice that they're at different distances from one another in the two pictures. The difference in the lateral positions of an object in the left and right eye image defines the retinal disparity for that object. The disparity in this scene is particularly easy to see in the arrangement of the champagne glasses and the pointing hand on the right side of each of the scenes. So hopefully you're able to depict that in this picture. Sty infections involve a hair follicle on the eyelid typically, and they're usually caused by staphylococci, meaning staphyli means those uh, irregular grape-like clusters, and cocci meaning those spherical shapes. You'll see a swollen red mass form on the eyelid here that will often produce purulent exudate. Other infections can include things like conjunctivitis or pink eye, trachoma, keratitis. Conjunctivitis is an infection or superficial inflammation of the lining of the membrane of the surface of the eye or eyelid. Acute conjunctivitis can be fungal or viral. Bacterial sources of conjunctivitis known as pink eye are extremely contagious. Trachoma is a bacterial infection spread through the contact with discharge from the eyes or the nose of an infected person. This is caused by the sexually transmitted disease chlamydia, and it can affect the conjunctivi lining in the upper eyelid. Adenovirus is the leading cause of conjunctivitis in adults with pharyngitis, fever, or inflamed preauricular lymph nodes, and it's contagious. Herpes simplex virus can also be a cause of viral conjunctivitis. Other viruses like hepatitis, HIV, HPV, genital warts are not likely to be in implicated in this. Conjunctivitis can also be caused by allergens, chemical irritants, tanning beds, UV sun rays. Irritants such as chemical splashes or other irritant exposure. Foreign objects such as contact lenses can also 
uh, cause conjunctivitis. It can, um, we can also have blocked tear ducts that can lead to this. Uh, symptoms would be redness, itching, excessive tearing. Pink eye mostly caused by Staphylococcus aureus. It often, often happens in children. The sclera and the eyelid will appear red. They may have a purulent discharge. It's spread by fingers or contaminated towels. It can happen with contact lens use, contaminated makeup, contaminated medication. And antibiotics are typically given to treat it to prevent damage to the cornea. Chlamydia, trochomatis, and gonorrhea can also infect the eyes of newborns. This would happen if mom had an infection during the delivery process. Neisseria gonorrhea is frequently transferred to the eyes by self-inoculation leading to conjunctivitis. Look at figure 15.3 in your book. Redness and heavy discharge running from the eyes are typical. This is an image of the gonococcal conjunctivitis. Pseudomonas or rhinosa can also occur around the soft contact lenses. So people that don't properly care for these contact lenses, this can be another common cause of conjunctivitis. If you look at this lens, this just shows you statistical data of the bacteria that has been recovered from contact lenses or their uh, solution. You know, again, this can come from people mishandling, uh, not washing their hands properly, a number of ways. And also remember that when the contact lenses are left on there all the time, the eye is not able to absorb that external oxygen. Trachoma is caused by chlamydia trochomatis that causes follicles to develop on the inside surface of the eyelid. It's highly contagious. It can happen in a situation where we don't have adequate water to wash our face and eyes and flies are able to carry the organism to the eyes. This is why it's a global issue here. If untreated, the eyelids would eventually become scarred and lashes will turn inward to abrade the cornea. I would probably know that, seen it on a few test questions. Globally, trachoma is the most common cause of vision loss but it's also easily treated and prevented. In this case, the patient would report a scratchy eye. There would not be much in the way of exudate present because it's not usually appearing in this condition. If we evert or flip that upper eyelid underneath, we would see these characteristic pearl-like follicles. Again, this is gonna cause scarring of the eyelid and abrading of the cornea which can affect the transparency of the lens. Keratitis is inflammation of the cornea. Usually along with this, the client will have severe pain. Severe pain and sensitivity to light or photophobia develop because the cornea itself has numerous pain receptors that are connected to trigeminal nerve or cranial nerve five. Keratitis is usually caused by some infection or injury. Herpes simplex virus is an example of corneal inflammation and ulceration. Trauma to the corneal can also increase the risk of visual loss. The cornea is finely structured to provide this transparent pathway for the light to come through. Abrasions can develop from foreign bodies that are caught either under the eyelid or from damage to uh, a contact lens or from objects directly scratching the cornea. Like sometimes people, you know, when they're mowing lawns or stuff, a tree limb will scratch it. Penetration injuries cause damage to the internal structure or loss of the vitreosis humor. The eye is susceptible to damage also from chemicals, splashes, or fumes. When someone has cataracts, they'll have a cloudy lens. The vision is much like smearing grease over the lens of a camera. A major cause of cataracts is aging. 
In glaucoma, we have an increased intraocular pressure. Remember that normal intraocular pressure should be 10 to 20 mmHg. Greater than 15 um, is not usually seen in most people, so most people's will be right around 15. Also, greater than 24 would be concerning. Now, usually this is going to be a little bit higher in the morning time, okay? But still, we would look at anything greater than 24. This will cause a loss of peripheral vision, meaning you wouldn't be able to see out to the side. Everything would be like you're looking through a tunnel. And so you will have what we call tunnel vision here. Age-related macular degeneration affects the macula. And remember that is located in that uh, fovea centralis. That is where our sharp central vision occurs. So when that area is damaged, we would have a decrease in the sharpness of our central vision. This would affect someone with fine details like trying to thread a needle. Retinal detachment is a medical emergency, and we can see this in patients that have things like diabetes and high blood pressure because it affects those small micro vessels that are located up there in the eye. This happens when the retina is pulled away from the vascular layer of the eyeball or the choroid. Remember, the choroid supplies the nutrients and some of the oxygenation. This is going to lead to ischemia to the neurons of the retina. Glaucoma is going to be caused by increased intraocular pressure, and this is typically due to excessive accumulation of the aqueous humor. Remember, that's supposed to be reabsorbed and drained at the same rate. Sometimes the canal of Schlem can be the problem here uh, where that's not working, so that's not helping to drain the fluid. Glaucoma is the most common and preventable loss of vision in developed countries. It can be acute or chronic. Signs and symptoms typically occur with halos around lights at night, loss of peripheral vision. So we have that tunnel vision I was talking about. The pain may also be present if the intraocular pressure is significantly increased as in the acute form of glaucoma. In acute narrow angle glaucoma, the angle between the cornea and the iris in the anterior chamber is decreased because of abnormal anterior insertion of the iris. With aging, the lens will enlarge, pushing the iris, iris forward to the side, blocking the outflow of the aqueous humor when the pupil is dilated. The thickened iris then fills the narrow angle. This causes pressure inside the eyeball, and the pressure can greatly increase within an hour of that pupil dilation and block the drainage of the fluid. This would cause acute or sudden um, glaucoma, where we have a sudden marked increase in the intraocular pressure. This can also lead to rapid and severe eye pain, face pain, and abrupt decrease in visual acuity. And these clients may need surgery. Chronic or open angle glaucoma, also known as wide angle glaucoma, is a common degenerative disorder normally observed in the older adult. In this case, the trabecular network and the canal of SLEM become obstructed. So the outflow of aqueous humor will slowly diminish. Intraocular pressure will increase slowly and the client is usually asymptomatic. The increased pressure begins to compress the blood flow to the retinal cells and this causes ischemia and damage to those retinal cells. If the pressure continues to increase, we'll see damage to the optic nerve. This can cause irreversible blindness eventually. We treat it through regular administration of eye drops. When observed through the pupil, the optic lens or the optic disc will appear eroded or cupped in chronic glaucoma because the optic nerve fibers are compressed. There's usually no initial clinical manifestations here. It typically affects 
both eyes and it results in painless gradual loss of the visual field remember with glaucoma we'll see a loss of peripheral vision and the vision will become more tunnel like On this slide here, you can see the uh, normal flow of the aqueous humor. So just take a good look at it. You can also see your canal schlem, the, trabic the trabicular mesh work that I talked about. Uh, sometimes they can do um, surgery there at the trabecular mesh work to actually uh, not really cure this, but it will open up the area so that the fluid can actually drain out. And then here, this just shows the degeneration or the obstruction of that trabecular meshwork, that canal of Schlem, and how it slowly over time will decrease the reabsorption of the aqueous humor. This is the acute or the narrow angle glaucoma. So here you see that the angle there um, in the uh, iris, between the iris and the cornea, it becomes narrowed that narrowing of that um, area causes the drainage to be blocked okay so that's going to stop the fluid from flowing out like it's supposed to or being reabsorbed like it's supposed to and then of course the pressure is going to build up all right cataracts this will um, occur when the lens becomes cloudy and it starts to interfere with the transmission of light it's typically caused by aging, so we have some sort of degeneration, but it can also be due to metabolic abnormalities such as diabetes. Excessive exposure to sunlight may also be a factor here. Uh, congenital cataracts are usually a result of some infection that occurred with mom, and it can also be attributed to infections with mom such as rubella or toxoplasmosis. Traumatic cataracts are typically the result of some trauma or blow to the eye in which the uh, iris pigment is damaged. These injuries are often associated with sports activities where we don't use um, correct eye protection. So as the uh, lens becomes cloudy, it interferes with the transmission of the light here in the cataracts. The size, the sight, and the density of the opacity or the cloudiness can vary among different people and even between someone's eyes. So one eye may uh, be worse than the other. With cataracts, blurred vision that progresses over the visual field and becomes darker in time is usually the only indicator. Clients will complain of seeing like cloudiness or shadows. When it becomes severe enough to interfere with the client's ability to function or work, the damaged lens can be removed and replaced by an artificial intraocular lens. Testing is required to look at retinal function, intraocular pressure, and possibility of other lesions such as tumors prior to the surgery. When the surgery occurs, it's laser and the degenerated material inside the lens is broken up by a process called phacoemulsification, then removed by suctioning, and the intraocular lens is put in position to replace the natural lens that was removed. In peripheral iridectomy, this is an excision of the portion of the periphery or the root of the iris, and this may be done to prevent post-operative glaucoma. So again, with these cataracts, the rate of impairment varies. Uh, cataracts can develop in one eye quicker than the other. It will definitely affect people's ability to function or work, and surgery is typically the treatment here to replace the cloudy lens. Retinal detachment is an acute emergency and problem that occurs when the retina tears away from the underlying choroid. Remember this choroid provides all the nutrients there. 
because of marked myopia degeneration with aging or scar tissue that creates tension on the retina. Treatment and interventions are aimed at bringing the retina and the choroid back in contact, reestablishing that blood supply to the retina. Surgical interventions such as scleral buckling or laser therapy may also be used to treat this with. Retinal detachment may recur and requires immediate attention to prevent vision loss. Remember, we see this in people that have things like diabetes or inflammatory disorders that can cause a tear or a hole in the retina, allowing the vitreous humor to enter and increase the tear. Detachment is usually detected through ophthalmology exams or ultrasound. These clients will have sudden, painless, rapid loss of vision. One standard statement is they feel a sense of a curtain or a veil being drawn across the vision. They'll often complain of floaters, irregular or dark lines or spots in their vision, cobwebs, flashes of light. This can rapidly progress to deterioration of vision, and if the macula is involved, it can involve loss of that central vision as well. So here, again, in this detached retina, that tear is going to allow the vitreous humor to flow behind the loose retinal portion. And as the increase in that vitreous humor occurs, it will seep behind the retina. The retina is then lifted away from the choroid. The retinal cells stop functioning because they're not getting the nutrients from that blood vessel that's in the choroids. This causes loss of function. It will cause an area of blackness in the visual field, and if separation continues, the retinal is deprived of the nutrients in the choroid, and it will die. There's no pain related to this tear, but initially the client will complain of light or dark floating spots in the visual field from blood or exudate from leaking from that tear. They'll have a dark or a blind area, that will increase with size and time. And that is described as the dark curtain that is drawn across the visual field. Some causes of retinal detachment include injuries, shrinkage of the vitreous humor gel from age or severe myopia, or clients that have glaucoma. Age-related macular degeneration is a common cause of visual loss in the older adult. This is caused by a combination of genetic factors and environmental exposure. This can be from exposure to things like ultraviolet rays or drugs. Degeneration will occur at the fovea centralis. Remember that is located in the macula lutea and the fovea centralis is that area where there are tons of cones. This is where our most acute vision comes from. There are two types of degeneration, dry or atrophic, and wet or exudative. In both types, the nutrients are no longer able to pass from the choroid into the retina. Central vision with high acuity would first be affected, where the vision will become blurred and then lost. Remember, I described a person trying to thread a needle, they would have like loss of being able to do detailed things, that close up um, acuity. Death perception is also affected here. The visual fields and the angiography will assist in the diagnosis of this. And this is a leading cause of legal blindness in the older adult. There are two types of macular degeneration. They're both painless. The most common type is the dry or atrophic type. Here we have deposits occurring in the retinal cells and those are destroying those retinal cells. In the wet or the exudative form, we have neovascularization with the formation of abnormal leaky blood vessels, which rapidly destroy the retina. This is going to offer you a comparison. So this is what someone would normally see. 
And this is going to be what someone with macular degeneration would see. So you see how blurry it is. You can't tell any details there. So you can understand why if someone tried to thread a needle or do something with detail, they're not going to be able to. All right, now we're going to talk about the ear. The ear is divided into three anatomic sections, the external ear, the middle ear, and the inner ear. All right, so external ear contains the pena, the external auditory meatus, known as the canal. The middle ear contains the tympanic membrane, those bony ossicles, the stapes, the incus, and the malleus. The auditory tube here connects the ear to the upper respiratory tract. And then you have the inner ear with the cochlea, which is the organ of corti responsible for hearing, and those semicircular canals that help control balance and equilibrium. The external ear is comprised of the pina or the visible flap on the side of the head and the external auditory canal. This canal passes through the temporal bone to the tympanic membrane or the eardrum. It marks the separation between the external and the middle ear. The middle ear is comprised of the tympanic cavity. It contains three tiny bones, the malleus, the incus, and the stapes. They compose the ossicles. The malleus adjacent to the tympanic membrane, and the stapes fit against the oval window. A membrane connects the middle ear and the inner ear. The inner ear is called the labyrinth. It's composed of two parts, the cochlea and the semicircle canals joined by a vestibule. These structures, structures consist of a bony labyrinth filled with a fluid perilymph, inside of which is a membranous labyrinth filled with endolymph. You'll hear about this endolymph fluid when you talk about Meniere's disease. The cochlea contains a complex arrangement of membranes surrounding the organ of corti, which is your hearing. These neurons form the cochlear branch of the auditory nerve, cranial nerve 8. This conducts impulses to the temporal lobe for reception and interpretation of sound. Some fibers from each ear cross to the auditory cortex in the opposite side or hemisphere, and some fibers remain on the same side. This allows auditory, the auditory area to receive sound from each ear. Our hearing begins with sound waves conducted in the air. The height of a wave determines the loudness of the sound and the number of sound waves in each time period or frequency determine the pitch, high or low. Sound waves will enter the external canal and strike against the tympanic membrane, causing it to vibrate. Vibration of the tympanic membrane will cause the malleus, the stapes, and the incus to vibrate. The motion of the stapes against the oval window causes movement of the perilymph and endolymph fluid in the cochlea. The water waves from the perilymph and endolymph fluid stimulate movement of the membranes and hair cells in the organ of corti, which produces stimulus into a nerve impulse. Nerve impulses are then conducted to the auditory area in the temporal lobe of the brain where sound is received and interpreted. The semicircular canals in the inner ear form three structures. They are all at right angles to each other. The sense of balance and equilibrium is focused in the crista ampullaris located in the ampulla of each semicircular canal and in the macula in the vestibule. Receptor hairs that are located here are stimulated by the motion of the endolymph fluid in response to any head movement or position change. Movement in any direction is detected because of the arrangement of these semicircle canals. 
any stimulus conducted by the vestibular branch of the auditory nerve to the medulla oblongata and other parts of the brain are detected. Remember that those cranial nerves are located in that uh, medulla oblongata, specifically the nuclei for a lot of those cranial nerves. There are other connections to the cerebellum to incoming proprioceptive impulses like the joints, muscles, and tendons, and to visual stimuli required for coordination of reflexes in order to maintain that body position. Vestibular damage can cause vertigo. This is where the body feels like it's rotating or with moving within that environment. And some people also refer to this as dizziness. There are two types of hearing loss. The first one is conduction and the second one is sensory neuro. There are tests that we can do to compare conduction by air through the external canal and conduction through the mastoid bone to assist in differentiating the type of loss. When we have conduction loss, the sound is blocked in the external ear or the middle ear, like when we block the sound with our earplugs. An accumulation of wax or foreign object in the external ear can block the sound waves. Scar tissue or adhesions may impair the function of the tympanic membrane or the ossicles because if it's not functioning, it may not vibrate. Uh, with sensory neural impairment, we see damage to the organ of corti, the auditory nerve, and this damage can be a, a result of infection, uh, head trauma, or some other neurological disorder that may affect the auditory nerve or the temporal lobe. So common causes of sensory neural impairment are things like rubella, influenza, herpes, uh, autotoxic drugs, such as uh, streptomycin, neomycin. Remember, myosins never let you win. They're toxic to your kidneys and your hearing. Uh, analgesics like aspirin or ibuprofen, as well as some of those loop diuretics like furosemide. Also, some of your antineoplastic or cancer agents can cause temporary or permanent hearing loss. One early sign of toxicity, like if you were given furosemide and the person complained of ringing in the ear or buzzing in the ear or tinnitus, we'd want to take a look at that. Also, very loud sounds can cause problems with our hearing. Uh, we may use um, drugs or things like that to counter the tinnitus, okay, or we may do some sort of noise therapy. So whenever we have exposure to very loud sounds for excessive periods of time or even a super loud sound just one time, uh, this could cause damage to the ears. So this would be associated as an occupational hazard. Um, like maybe you're a sound person for a rock and roll band. Presbycusis is sensory neuro loss. This usually occurs in the elderly due to a reduced number of hair cells or other degeneration in the cochlea. It also could be some sort of congenital defect. All right, so presbycusis is something that typically we see in older people, again, because of a reduced number of hair cells or receptor cells or some other degeneration that's occurring in the cochlea. Congenital deafness, this is um, inherited or it can also be a result of infection or trauma during pregnancy or delivery. For this, we want early diagnosis and treatment in order to help with development of the child. Hearing impairment in young children can interfere with their speech and social development as well as other interactions with people in learning disabilities. And loss of hearing also can lead to things like depression. All right, so we do have a lot of assistive devices now available to help improve communication skills. Hearing aids are used if they're appropriate. There are other types of hearing aids that can amplify sound and uh, improve the ability to hear. Cochlear implants are also used successfully in some cases of sensory neural loss, especially in young congenitally, congenitally deaf children or 
It can also be used in adults. With these implants, sound can be picked up by an external microphone and bypass the structures in the ear to help stimulate the auditory nerve, as in figure 15.9 in your book. The auditory area of the brain would then interpret the input. This mechanism can be used when receptor cells in the cochlea don't function, but the auditory nerve is still intact. It typically has to be used by um, a certain age to be most effective, but it still can be used in adults. And with newborns now, we have certain laws about how we're screening them when they're coming um, out of the hospital so that we can make sure that, you know, going home, that their hearing is intact. Also, you may have to screen a newborn child if you were going to start them on one of those myosins, like gentamicin, because we would want to know that the hearing was intact before we start them on that drug, since that drug has the ability to affect the hearing. This way, we would know if there was a problem with the hearing prior to starting the drug. We would always want to try to put that hearing back to the previous level of functioning, but sometimes the effects can be irreversible. All right, so here is a picture of that um, 15.9 from your book with that cochlear implant and showing you how that it actually transmits that sound. Just take a good look at it. As always, I tell you, always look at your charts um, in your book because they do like to test from the charts. Otitis media, this is inflammation or infection of the middle ear. Here we have exudate that builds up in the cavity, causing excessive pressure on the tympanic membrane. It interferes with the movement of the tympanic membrane, which remember that vibrates during hearing and then vibrates those ossicles. So it's going to interfere with the movement of both of those. The auditory tube is also obstructed because of inflammation. This prevents damage by um, stopping the fluid from being drained into the nasal pharynx. Okay, so we have that additional fluid there and pressure. Enlargement of the adenoids can also compress the tube and cause increasing pressure, and eventually this can rupture the tympanic membrane. Any prolonged infection is likely to produce scar tissue here. Adhesions can also develop, and this can cause permanent conductive hearing loss. Chronic infection can lead to an infection that involves the mastoid cells of the temporal bone known as mastoiditis. That's pretty serious. People usually end up uh, in the hospital behind that and a lot of times on pick lines because they need a long course of antibiotics for that. The mucosa in the middle ear can also become inflamed because of allergies or infections that spreads along that continuous mucosa from the nasopharynx and the respiratory tract. This can happen easily in young children or infants because that auditory canal is going to be shorter and wider and it forms more of a right angle to the nasopharynx. This promotes drainage of those respiratory secretions into that auditory tube. Infants also spend a lot more, re more time in a recumbent position or feeding in a supine position, and this encourages reflux of those fluids into the ear as well. Otitis media can occur more frequently in the winter, and this is because we typically have more upper respiratory infections during that time. People blow their nose and that backwash can cause ear infections. Common bacterial causes include hemophilus influenza, pneumococci, beta-hemolytic streptococci, and staphylococci. Viral infections can also lead to otitis media, which is frequently comp complicated by secondary bacterial infection. And bacterial infections would usually have a purulent discharge. Remember that streptococci now, that's uh, a chain. Strepto is a chain, right? And cocci is spear, so we have a chain of these balls. Once in a while, otitis media is asymptomatic, but more often we have severe pain or 
otalgia or earache related to the pressure on that tympanic membrane and those nerve receptors that lie in the cavity. The tympanic membrane will appear red and bulging. Remember, most of the time it should be pink and pearly gray. Infants and young children will often rub or pull at the ear, showing that they're in distress. Mild hearing loss or feeling of fullness or congestion is common. Other signs of infection would include things like fever or nausea. Sometimes we'll see a sudden relief in the pain, and this is usually due to rupture of the tympanic membrane. You'll also see with that a purulent discharge from the external ear canal. Otitis externia, sometimes called swimmer's ear, is an infection that occurs in the external auditory canal and the pena. And it's usually caused by bacteria, um, fungal in nature. It also is associated with swimming and irritation of any sort of organism when cleaning the ear or frequently using headphones or earplugs can also produce this. All right, we're just going to uh, briefly cover the treatment. So ibuprofen for pain within those first 24, 48 hours. Uh, antibacteria if an infection is there. So some doctors have gotten away from this. They'll only give the um, antibiotics if there's an actual infection. They might use a decongestant. And then if they're recurrent, then they might do surgery to put some sort of tubes in. This is mostly for kids. All right, that's your normal tympanic membrane. As I stated, that should be sort of pink and pearly gray. And then when it's infected, then it would have this red bulging appearance to it. Autosclerosis involves an imbalance in the bone formation and resorption process with development of excess bone here in the middle ear cavity. The stapes become fixed to the oval window and that causes blockage of conduction of sound into that cochlea. Autosclerosis appears to be genetic and for these clients uh, they may need some sort of surgical removal of the stapes with the prosthesis put in place to restore their hearing. Meniere syndrome, this is a disorder I brought up earlier. This is in the inner ear or the labyrinth. And what we have is excessive endolymph fluid. It can develop intermittently, stretching the membrane, interfering with the function of hair cells in the cochlea and the vestibule. So too much endolymph fluid here usually. Rupture of the labyrinth membrane can allow the perilymph also to mix with the endolymph, which would increase the volume and cause an attack. What we typically see here is severe vertigo, dizziness, sensation of whirling and weakness, accompanied by loss of balance and falls. So safety is an issue here. Um, they also may experience tinnitus with excessive noise, a roaring or ringing in the ear, unilateral hearing loss, nausea and sweating, inability to focus, uh, nystagmus, which is that involuntary rapid movement of the eyeball. They can have excessive pressure in the ear and repeated occurrences can cause permanent damage to the hair cells with permanent loss of hearing and vertigo. And this is typically treated with things like Dramamine or um, there's another one that we give for uh, motion sickness and that's the kind of drugs that they usually use, scopolamine. So again, those uh, characteristics of Meniere's are going to be severe vertigo or dizziness with falls, uh, weakness, tinnitus with that excessive noise or roaring like motor or ringing, uh, unilateral hearing loss, nausea, sweating, inability to focus, nystagmus. So for uh, this disease, Meniere's, we would be looking at balance tests just to make sure that uh, it is the endolymph fluid. They would also do uh, an ENG just to evaluate the balance and look at that eye movement. They would check for abnormal buildup of the endolymph and 
the other fluids in the ear. They also would look at uh, electrocoleography, which tests their response to sound, and an MRI to rule out any other tumor or abnormal structures.